This episode of The Beancast is brought to you by Content Marketing World, the world's premier content marketing event. Find out more at contentmarketingworld.com today. Use the offer code BEANCAST. Bandwidth provided by Recursive Squirrel Interactive. Visit them on the web at recursivesquirrel.com. Episode 551, Inbox 100,000. July 15th, 2019. It's time for this week's edition of The Beancast, a weekly discussion about the news and issues facing marketers today. I'm your host, Bob North. Thanks for joining us. Free fast shipping. It's become the baseline of expectation among consumers for e-commerce retailers. But is it a reasonable expectation or just another way that the big players are making it impossible for small players to compete? Tonight, we'll discuss. Also, Google's latest stab at social. Facebook lets users see why they were targeted. McKinsey reminds us about email. Plus the good, the bad, and the ugly. That's the lineup. Let's meet tonight's panel. Thanks for joining us for this week's Beancast. I'm Bob Norp, and with me on the panel for this evening, we start with the Chief Strategy Officer for marketing agency Roxa. Mr. Ian Bear is here. Hi, Ian. Hello. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing well, and thanks for having me. It's always fun to do this with you guys. Now, next, she's the creative director that put the Moose Knuckles Canada fashion brand on the map and is now moving on to as yet unnamed exciting new opportunities Miss Stephanie Hoff is here. Hi, Stephanie. Hey, Bob. And finally, a longtime television executive who's turned consultant and is currently working with AMC on the brand creative for several of their shows. Mr. Bill Hartnett is here. Bill, welcome back. Hey, Bob. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. <laughs> Excited to be on this show because we have a lot of great stuff to cover and I've got a fantastic panel to do it. So let's just jump right in. First up, while the race is on among the big players in retail to offer free one-day or even same-day shipping, that race is creating massive problems for smaller platform sellers like Etsy and Shopify. Putting aside the speed issue, free shipping alone is a tough stance to take with home-based businesses using these platforms. Essentially, you know, you've got to force everybody to toe the line in terms of trying to get everybody on board with this free shipping thing. But when you have a home-based business, that's a massive expense that they've got to suck down or they've got to charge to their clients in added fees. So it becomes problematic over and over again for these players to basically compete with the players like Amazon who are out there doing it. Ian, first, is free shipping a mandatory for all of e-commerce? And if so... How does this affect the ability of new brands to launch either independently or on a competing platform? What's your take on the situation? I think mandatory is a strong word. I, I think it certainly represents the easiest, most understandable table stakes for an e-commerce player. Mm. Um, I think if you don't offer free shipping, um, and, and again, now, as you pointed out, Bob, not just free, but free and fast with with Amazon and Jet and others being able to turn things around in a day with with uh, third party delivery services like Postmates really invading the e-commerce space. You know, Postmates is no longer just about lunch. It's I needed an Apple part and, you know, I had a Postmate running to the Apple store for me and had it to my hotel in 45 minutes. <laughs> so it's, it's speed and uh, and free are wonderful things. However, you know, for a more curated experience, for a higher service experience, for a product that might be exclusive or in an exclusive form, people are still willing to forego free shipping. I think when they see a commoditized offering and you're not ready to ship it for free, you lose. 
So your your contention is that it's mainly can uh, it's it's mainly the kind of products that everybody buys, like toilet paper and and um, you know, toothpaste and all the other products like that. That that's the kind of products that need to ship for free. Um, because I I I would say that yes, there's still a lot of room left in the marketplace for people to have exclusive experiences that are worth waiting for or exclusive products that are worth waiting that extra time and paying a little extra in shipping. But those experiences are few and far between and they're becoming fewer and far between. So how do we maintain, how do we even compete in that, in, in that environment? Especially if you don't have some kind of exclusive product, you just have something that's maybe a little bit more handmade or a little bit uh, less exciting than say something from Supreme or something. <laughs> well, I look service is another major aspect and we're seeing in certain sectors, just a higher level of service often just enabled by better use of data and tech uh, representing something that, is more valuable. In the end, everything's a trade-off. So again, I think free shipping is critical when your offering is completely commoditized. And you know what? If you're going to try to get into a space like electronics and compete with Amazon, well, good luck. Because, you know, Amazon and Best Buy have sort of cornered the market on getting it to you free and quickly. But there's a lot of opportunities for experiences that are higher touch, more bespoke. I'll, I'll tell you one e-commerce player uh, that I've got my eye on locally here in New York, and you may not be familiar with them outside New York, although they're becoming very well capitalized, is Capsule. Oh, now, yeah, Capsule. Yeah, very familiar. Capsule, if you don't know them, is an app-based pharmacy Right now, I think they're still only available in Manhattan, but they're taking something that was completely commoditized, right? I'm going to pay the same copay for my drugs no matter what pharmacy I go to. Amazon and others have really tried to get into that monthly recurring revenue space of having my drugs you know, shipped to me automatically. And, but the truth is Capsule delivers so much of a better service experience that they've broken out of the commodity without giving anything away. Um, so I think there are lots of opportunities to offer higher touch, more bespoke, more exclusive. But if you're going to get into a commodity street fight, yeah, fast and free has to go with, with the shipping. I would love to get Stephanie's opinion on all this because, Stephanie, you've worked for a luxury brand essentially for a number of years now, and you've dealt with that market from a completely different standpoint. I mean, a standpoint of exclusivity and, and um, uh, value and, you know, ex excessive amounts of price tags on price tags and stuff. I mm -hmm. mean, it's just like you've, you've dealt with this from a completely different standpoint. Was free shipping still an issue with you when you were dealing with that? I don't think when it gets to a certain price point that, you know, free shipping really becomes like a major factor, especially if you're paying over a thousand dollars for outerwear, handbags, footwear. Um, I think it does become a variable when you're thinking about the cost. It could be on sale somewhere else and free shipping is not even a factor if you're saving $50 or $70. Um, a lot of different um, e-commerce uh stores offer, you know, 10% for new subscribers and things like that. And then when you're getting into luxury purchases, 10% can be massive. So I think that it's more when you're getting into that range, that price point range, there's just a number of different factors. And a lot of it is experience as well. And retailers that you're comfortable with. I think Essence, um, based out of Montreal, they're just like really dominating the market, even on the US side. Um, and they have three-day shipping. Um, it's free. And their whole customer service, user experience, every inch of the journey with them is just, it's really, really well. It's really exemplary. So that's a retailer that I would be willing to uh, forego any sort of, you know, pr price break that I could get um, to purchase with them because I know that it's seamless. I know that, you know, the goods are going to get to me in, you know, great state and condition 
and you know they're going to arrive in my way in my in my door with you know that whole luxury experience that I have in mind. So yeah. And and really, when we think about it, um, even Amazon doesn't really offer free shipping. I mean, they offer Amazon Prime, which costs you money and then gives you free shipping that you're actually paying for from month to month. Yeah, you get a lot of extras in that, but you're still paying for it. And that's what really confuses me about this issue over free fast shipping, because I think the consumer is convinced that they want this, that it has some value, but it really offers almost zero value to the consumer because they're paying for it one way or another. I mean, it's, it's like, it's, it's almost like bait and switch. I remember when we were doing some work with a client and they had, um, they had tested over and over again, uh, 15% off versus free shipping and 15% off on the product that they were selling was always like $20 and shipping was always like $12 and free shipping always won. And it, it seems like this is just, it's just ludicrous. It's almost like it's an education problem with the consumer. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think it's, it's education, but it's not, it's not necessary. I think, you know, really working on that, that consumer experience when they open up the package. And I think that's when you're going to get repeat business as well too. When they open up the package, when it arrives at their house in a certain way in a state, um, I think that, you know, builds a more emotional connection. And I think, I don't know, people will get over it, get over free shipping and they'll be looking for, you know, the unveiling, the unpackaging and, and what that was and what the consu- the customer service was like and, and that whole step of the journey. Bill, um, w- for you as a consumer, I mean, going into this, dealing with this directly, I mean, which is more important? Is shipping more important? Shipping speed, fast, free shipping? Or is it more important to have lots of selection? Because those are the two issues. You have, you're, you're competing against Amazon. You're competing against fast service. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, f- uh, fast free shipping and lots and lots of selection. Anything that you need, you can get from Amazon. You can get it fast and free. And when you're competing against that, which is the bigger issue for you as a, as a retailer or a vendor or someone trying to compete with the Amazons of the world? Is, is it the selection that's killing you or is it the free shipping that's even bigger, a bigger hurdle for you to get over? Well, as a, as a consumer, it seems almost anything that I buy outside of sort of the Amazon ecosystem does have a shipping cost. And it's like, I don't care so much about a shipping cost if it's, you know, if it's less than $10. When it gets to be more than $10, it bothers me. It feels like, it feels like when you buy a ticket at Ticketmaster. And again, you give me 20% off or you give me free shipping, I will always go for free shipping. And I, I know that sounds weird because it seems like an added cost as opposed to a discount, if that makes any sense. Mm. And it, I think it is, you know, it's like, wait, you're going to make, you're going to, I have to pay more for this. And again, you know, for commodity stuff, for if I just want to buy something on Amazon and half the time, you know, a box shows up, you don't even remember, oh yeah, I ordered that thing a couple days ago. Um, because it's usually not that remarkable, but if it's something special, again, I, I honestly expect it to take a few days. And one of the, one of the interesting things that I, So this is a a personal anecdote. Um, My son adopted some chickens about a year ago. So now I am a farmer. (laughs) And I have have chickens? I have have two chickens that lay eggs. So I have to buy chicken feed. No, no. Everybody out there should know that he does not live in the country here. (laughs) (laughs) Well, exactly. But but to a, a farm supply store, the nearest farm supply stores to me are about 40 or 50 miles away. So I have to drive to the farm supply store to buy the chicken feed, which comes in 50-pound bags. And the company offers lots of shipping on lots of things. But anything that's heavy, you got to go pick it up. Mm. And so like that, I would pay for the shipping because I don't feel like driving two or three hours back and forth, which I do every few months, to buy 150 pounds of chicken don't feed. Don't worry, Ian. Ian will hook you up with Postmates before we're done <laughs> yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I... I was going to say, I hope somebody from Chewy.com is listening because it sounds like they need to branch into the chicken feed business. <laughs> I'm wondering. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's honestly, yeah, it's like if I'm going to buy, you know, almost any time I buy, you know, if I buy running shoes or if I buy anything like that, that's sort of a specialty item, I kind of expect it to be 
you know, five or six bucks in shipping and it's going to take a week. If I'm buying what, it, you know, diapers for the two year old, I want it tomorrow and I don't want to pay shipping. And, and getting back to my original question about the selection versus the free fast shipping, I think that you've answered my question beautifully. This idea of selection is the more important thing. It's not that you need to be as massive as Amazon and have complete selection, but you need to be focused entirely on the selection that matters most and giving people the options that they need to get that product as easily as possible, whether or not they have to pay for shipping or not. I mean, it's, it, it seems to me like that's more the answer, that you need to carve out that niche. Am I, am I hearing you right on that? Yeah, I mean, if you're providing, if, if you're providing like sort of, I guess, specialty value, because there are those things that we need and the things that we want. And the things that I need, I don't want to pay for shipping. And the things that I want, you know, yeah, I'm, I, it, I, I understand it's going to take a little longer because it's usually it's it's if I can't find it on Amazon, if it's, a, you know, whether it's a book or like a vinyl record or chicken, you know, chicken feed or a, a running shoe that I want, I kind of expect it's there are going to be additional costs and time involved. Ian. Talk to me about the future of this. I mean, it's just like, are we going to see free fast grow everywhere, continue to dominate, continue to be the way of the future, and and um, that's just the way it's going to be, um, you know, with logistics playing the biggest part in this? Or is this going to have a, like a, a certain amount of backlash as people start to realize, I'm not really getting this for free. I'm paying Amazon for Amazon Prime to do this. And, you know, it's just like the prices are being adjusted by the third party retailers on Amazon all the time to account for the free shipping. You can always find the same price with shipping cost um, listed right next to the free shipping option, which costs the same as with the shipping cost. You know, it's just like it seems to me that somewhere along the line, consumers are going to wake up or am I being way too generous with consumer mentality? Well, I, I think it's less about consumers being asleep at the wheel and more about people being really busy and distracted and, and a bit overwhelmed sometimes with the sheer number of, of choices they have. Uh, look, is fast and free here to stay? Nothing's really here to stay. Everything's pretty cyclical. Mm. Uh, I do think, again, as as everybody's bringing up, the more commodity things, the more we're talking about staples and necessities that I can get from a hundred places, the tougher it's going to be to get away with charging shipping. But as Amazon has learned and proven, we think back to the days not that long ago where Amazon had a very tough time turning a profit. Uh, I know it, it, it seems like such a distant memory now, but it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> and, and one of the things that they realized was mm, free ish is good for a business more than free. So they realized that they couldn't ship every $4 item on its own for free. They couldn't get you everything within a day or two because some things they didn't want to bother warehousing and had to rely on third party sellers who might need three days to get it to you, even with prime shipping. And, um, and then yes, there are the membership fees and they've come up with other ways, of course, to justify the value of that $10 or so that, that I'm paying every month and you know access to video and music and such, all of those things break the commodity. But there's always gonna be higher end, better, more bespoke, higher service experiences. And the fact is free shipping is an offer. That's all it is. Offer me something better. Offer me something more interesting something that's more right for me, more relevant to who I am, reflective of what I want out of life, and free shipping becomes a, a lesser consideration. Well, that leads me really beautifully into my final question on this subject, which is basically, can you market your way out of the free fast problem? It sounds like you're saying you can. You absolutely can. Uh, it, again, the market has been trained it sort of reminds me now I'm really going to date myself with this reference, but some of my earliest career experience was in the old long distance wars uh, <laughs> of, of the U.S. market in the 1990s. 
And I laughed you know, because so I somebody recognize Somebody had this. The, the idea, I think it was MCI, um, to say, we can get people to switch their phone service if we send them a live check in the mail. And when somebody's desperate enough for that money, they'll have no problem switching phone service. So then everyone started doing it, and it became an expectation that if I was going to change phone carriers, somebody was going to pay me to do it. Um, marketers set expectations like that all the time. The bar has been set at fast and free, but there are better mousetraps being built every day, higher end, more bespoke, higher touch experiences that people are willing to pay for. You just got to be a, a lot more creative. Well, we're going to move on and we're going to talk next about Google getting back into the social media business with Shoelace, a new service that they're trying out here in New York. We'll get to that in just a minute. But first, I want to talk about our sponsor for this evening. I've been talking about Content Marketing World with you guys out there because they are very interested in getting agency people to go to this show. And I know you've got so many conference choices you can go to. And there's so many different things that you could do. But Content Marketing World is really pretty exceptional in the way that they've put this together. I mean, first of all, don't think that this is a small conference. This is a huge, huge deal. Nearly every major brand globally is going to be in attendance, and they're expecting over 4,000 attendees. Now, that's a lot of people, and that's a lot of people who are meaningful to your business, especially as an agency, because you can get to go and be in the same room with some of the most important people at brands doing content marketing all over the world. You're going to have access to them. That's a new business opportunity that you cannot let go. But besides that, you're going to get some great content because Content Marketing World is the world's original and largest annual gathering of content marketing professionals, all coming to hear the latest thinking on every imaginable subject about content marketing. And, you know, I've been also over the past few weeks telling you about some of the people that are going to be speaking at this event. And a lot of them are beancasters who you've known and loved and actually tuned into the show over and over again to hear speak about marketing. I mean, people like Ann Hanley and Kate O'Neill, um, Scott Monty, um, Jesper Larson, uh, Christopher Penn. I mean, so many of these great, great speakers and experts in content marketing are going to be there at this event. And I want you guys in the agency world to check this out because they are doing things specifically for your business to make sure that you come away with some good thinking. Now, think about it. This, this is not just for strategists. This is not just for creatives. This is for business development people in your agency. This is for your account managers at your agency because it's going to teach you about how to do everything about content marketing that you may not realize is going on in the industry right now. It's, it's focused entirely on a piece of the business that is growing and expanding at nearly every single agency out there. They've got a complete agency track of sessions, a branded content track. They've even got that free booze for you that one night because they're going to be doing, they're going to be doing an agency-exclusive cocktail hour. And like I've been saying, uh, that free booze shows you that they're really interested in having you at this event. So come on, get, a, get to the website, find out a little bit more about this. There's no good excuse not to send at least one member of your staff and I think you yourself should think about coming to this event in Cleveland, Ohio on September 3rd through the 6th. That's the place. Those are the dates. Don't wait. Register today at contentmarketingworld.com. Use the offer code BEANCAST and make sure it's all caps. That'll do us a favor because it lets them know that this reference came from our show. But make sure you use all caps BEANCAST and they'll knock $100 off your price tag when you do that. That's contentmarketingworld.com, offer code BEANCAST. Register today, and I'll see you at this year's event. Well, Google announced that we're, they're getting back into the social media business, but this time they're going to do it with a local focus. The app, which is called Shoelace, is an invite-only beta in New York City right now, and it's designed to connect people of similar interests as well as existing friend groups together for real-world activities. So, Steph, um, tell me what your thoughts are. Good idea or just a group of features that everybody already turns off in other apps like dating apps? <laughs> you know, that's the first thing I thought when I yeah. saw this. You know, I'm sitting there going, 
you know, when you get an app like OkCupid, this is where the first thing you turn off is the location <laughs> identification stuff. Yeah, I think that it's getting lost in in some other, like Facebook has something similar, Bumble. Tinder had the Tinder social uh, feature for a little while. They had a short stint with it, but it's gone now. Um, and then there's apps like Cheers, which you can like connect with people for drinks and then meet my dog. Um, so it's like a dog meetup app. They're too specific for mass adoption. Um, I think there's definitely a potential for it to work, especially since they're launching it in New York, which is a busy transient city and people are looking to connect with each other. Um, the advantage for Google seems pretty obvious. Um, upon launch or eventually, they'll probably give brands access to these groups to effectively target customers through integration um, with community and culture. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing. Just, you know, marketers being more strategic about the, how they engage with their audience and mirroring shifting values towards real world, world connection, experience and um, transparency. Um, I, think, I think it actually has the potential to work just because it's a platform focused on that. Um, myself, I've been looking for outdoor movies in New York, and I found a couple websites that talk about them or list them, but there's no way to really, they're, they're not all there on any website, and there's no way to like really share it easily with friends. So to have everyone there already on the platform, to be able to see all of the events that are local and kind of organize them, and then be able to invite people, I think, if it's you know if it's not getting lost in a, mother, a bunch of other features that are pulling you in other directions, I think that it really has the potential to take off. Yeah, I can see it really helping in those situations. And by the way, I know someone who has uh, curates an Excel spreadsheet for some reason. I don't know why she chooses to do that, but curates an Excel spreadsheet of everything to do outside in New York during the summer. So it's pretty amazing. I'll get you hooked up on that. But I should get that. Yeah. <laughs> But, um, I, I think especially too, Bob, like 20 years ago, the majority of us, you know, listened to Top 40 radio and watched primetime television. So we all kind of were on, you know, the same, you know, definitely on the same page in some ways. And I think as people become more diverse and their interests become super hyper specific um, because of the Internet, I think that, you know, marketers are looking for a way to kind of target these very like niche um, micro majorities. And I think this is a really great way to, for them to access. The, the advantage for Google is, is very obvious. And the advantage for the user is pretty cool as well. Now, I should have started off by asking everybody, did anybody actually get into this beta? Because when I went to it, they weren't even putting me on a wait list. They said, you know, this is like too much demand. And I, I did it like the same day that the news came out. So this went pretty quick. Anybody managed to get into this beta? No, I tried as well, too, and I wasn't able to get an invite. Yeah, yeah, clearly I'm not cool enough. No, I did not. Oh, man. I was hoping one of you could have. I, I thought I thought for sure Ian would with his big fancy CSO title, but uh, apparently they didn't I'm, really. I'm disappointed in myself and the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's not you. I figured Google would have been in touch. You know, that's something that they want to do. Um, what is the potential platform the central value of this platform to marketers, Bill, what, what do you think could potentially help a marketer out having access to a platform like this? I mean, obviously they haven't talked about advertising. They haven't even begun to speculate how they're going to monetize, if they're going to monetize this platform. So what will your thoughts be? Well, it's just really seeing what people are doing, what they're interested, where interests are spiking, where people are congregating and, you know, sort of what, are, what, are, where, when this, when this app, actually really starts to have more than just sort of a, you know, a beta testing group when it starts to add people to see, you know, what are people really doing? Because I think, again, as much as, you know, companies can know about how people are behaving, where they're going and how I can, you know, as a brand sort of wedge my way into the, the into the cracks there, that's really, you know, honestly, that's, that's what's interesting to see if this does, if this does gain any mass and velocity in terms of usership. Um, finding out what, you know, what, what people are really doing as opposed to, you know, what we think they're doing. And again, and again, it's, you know, we're going to, I know we're going to talk about this in coming up uh, a little bit on the Facebook thing, but it is, it is kind of creepy. <laughs> and then it's like, I, you know, that again, that when you realize how much people know or how much they can find out. Um, but at the same time, if, 
I do find that, you know, when I, I, there are relevant marketing experiences and I know, you know, that's, you know, I'm interested. I, as a, as a consumer, I'm interested. And as a marketer, how can I sort of find my way in without, you know, without being the old guy in the bar, so to speak? <laughs> I think even less too about not just mining for data too, but a way that brands can integrate with culture, fuel it. Um, by being able to like, yeah. for example, like offer free yoga classes or tight roping or punk rock shows or whatever people are interested in, how that feels brand adjacent for them, being able to really offer people a value in participating with their brand um, and kind of inviting them into a community around their brand. And we're seeing like brands do that so well, like Nike, for example. Um, but it's not just about yet yeah, under understanding who your target audience is but about, um, yeah, really, you know, becoming part of that culture surrounding that community. I like where you're going on that, this whole idea of creating of event-based strategies where you're trying to get people out to interact with us in the real world, or maybe not even to interact with us as a brand, just to say, we're a brand, but we're putting this on for a whole bunch of people to come out and watch a movie this the, in, in the park. We're going to set something up for a one-time only thing, or we're going to do a barbecue, or we're going to do something mm -hmm. that's going to get everybody out in the real world, as opposed to just congregating people on a lifeless Facebook page. It gets people out in the real world. But I, I, I want to go back to what uh, what Bill was saying about the, the data, because for me... And I, I, tell me if I'm wrong, Ian. This this sounds like the real purpose of this entire app in Google's mind, because this is what Google does. Google um, aggregates information and then serves it back in relative um, results based on the intent you expressed in your search. And adding in the ability to know where you are in the real world, in addition to where you go online adds a whole other dimension that's really important to Google's growth strategy as they try to penetrate into local markets uh, with their local business initiatives. So am, am I on the right track here with that thinking? Well, yeah, of course. Look, it, it, it's funny how, you know, for us marketers, we've always known that Google and Facebook are in the business of monetizing data. That is literally what their business is. Um, for a lot of people, it seems to have caught them by surprise that that data gets used <laughs> in all sorts of scrupulous ways and less so. But um, but people will, to Bill's earlier point, uh, they're okay with relaxing some of their needs for privacy and data protection if they're receiving something of value. And you know, more and more, what we see for brands. Uh, akin to the things that that Stephanie was describing, is that soft benefits soft benefits are starting to become increasingly more important to consumers because hard benefits become very commoditized, uh, discounts, mm -hmm. points, back to free shipping. Right, uh, that's really easy to replicate, but an experience or access or connection to like-minded human beings that becomes really valuable. So doing something like this at the local level, it's a really interesting spin. Google can afford to make lots of mistakes, like, like my beloved Yankees. They don't have to get everything right to win overall. So yeah, along the way, you're going to have, you know, the Google Glasses of the world. Uh, but I still uh, think Google Glasses are coming back. They're going to come oh, back in some kind of big way. Everybody does. You know, they'll eventually get it right. <laughs> although I don't know. They... I'm still waiting for them to get the pixel right. So um, <laughs> that uh, that amazes me that that the mobile phone business has eluded Google the way it has. Again, I, I think it's a smart move for Google. It's a good opportunity for brands. And for Google, it's fairly low risk. They're doing it in one market. The more it becomes about access and connection at the local level, Especially, you know, I love Stephanie, Stephanie pointed out the transient nature of a market like New York or, you know, another one like Dallas or Seattle, where, you know, a lot of the people who are there haven't been there very long. Austin, uh, something like this could thrive if what I receive is, is of value to me and, and of relevancy. 
Well, I certainly do appreciate the fact that unlike what they did with Google+, Plus, they're not doing a wide rollout right away and just inviting the masses to hate on it right away. I mean, it's just like I think the rollout was just completely flawed from the beginning when they rolled out Google+. Plus. But taking it in a smaller doses with one market seems to be a much more logical approach. And we'll just have to wait and see when we get our chance to play with the app, which may be sometime next year for a while. We're going to be waiting for it, but we'll see. Well, um, moving on, Bill talked about Facebook. Uh, we do have a Facebook subject I needed to talk about. We always seem to have a Facebook subject because they always get into trouble. I can't count the number of times that people have wondered to me if Facebook was secretly listening because their ad targeting was so creepily specific. I hear this all the time. We were talking about this and suddenly I was seeing ads for that. Well, now Facebook is unveiling new tools for users, users to know exactly why and how they were targeted. The data includes social graph levers, third-party data, location tracking, everything that we know about the platform and what they're using. My question, Bill, is will this appease customers or send people into a tailspin knowing how much marketers know about them? <laughs> well, you know, I... I no, yes, no, yes. I, <laughs> the, the, I, I think the thing that, that's very funny is over over time, you know, there are these uh, occasional where there's you read about, you know, that uh, huge data issues at Facebook where, you know, with Cambridge Analytica, things like that. And you have all you'll have a group of people. I'll have a group of friends who will very indignantly and publicly. I'm quitting Facebook. Um, oh, I hate that. People, I hate that. <laughs> other people will discover that wait, they know all this stuff about me? It's like, well, you did sign up and you've been revealing personal details for the last eight years. So yes, they do know that. But what's pretty funny is so prior to this, I did go to my ad preferences and I am kind of shocked at how little they know about me uh, <laughs> um, or, 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 or how it, it seems like they knew me in high school and, 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 and think I'm the same or something like that. I mean, I, I know it sounds funny because what I saw was really that it's sort of vague, like a very vague picture of stuff that I might like, but it was not really accurate or or that interesting or sho you know or shocking. What's more shocking is, and again, is you know you do a search, you do a web search, and then it, immediately I start getting served ads. I mean, it happened the other day. My son, uh, my five year old son, is fascinated with a YouTube guy called Unspeakable who plays Minecraft and. Um, jumps off his roof into the pool and, you know, does all kinds of pranks and stuff like that. So he, my son keeps talking about unspeakable merch. He wants merch at five. <laughs> and so I went to look at his website to see what kind of stuff he has because he has a birthday coming up. Hopefully he won't listen to the podcast and know what he's going to get. Um, so I immediately started getting served every time, every time I look at Facebook, I get an unspeakable merch ad now. <laughs> and so, you know, that's, what's always very, very interesting is that, you know, they, they track your web web activity so very well. But when I did go in, you know, again, when I went into the ad preferences, it, it didn't surprise me in any way. And it actually sort of was like, wait, how, what gave them that impression? And, you know, that I, I clicked off a few things. I thought, well, I, I really don't want anything. Um, because that's something I'm not interested in at all. But honestly, I don't. I don't think one. They make it hard to find. Um, it is. It's not. It as easy as they make it sound in their blog posts. It's really, you. You know, you have to. You have to find uh, your ad preferences. It's not that easy to get to. And then when you get there, it's like you know you can kind of scroll around. But that's really not. I don't know. I don't think. I don't think it's going to send anybody into a tailspin. Other than. You know, I'm sure I'll have one or two friends who will indignantly quit Facebook. But other than that, uh, I think we're all pretty happy with what we get for free uh, by telling them our life story every day. You know, uh, I, I, I'm not really sure where to go with this because it's just like when I'm looking at the 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 ad choices that are in my platform you know it's just like i'm not seeing anything that's really all that unusual and you're absolutely right it's almost like they don't really know you as well as you think they know you but why is it that the ads continue to be so incredibly creepily well targeted based on the activities or the intentions of certain people that they express you know, it's 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 just mind-boggling to me how they can still be so 
intentional and yet have so little information on me. I, I'm starting to wonder whether or not it's it's true that they're being transparent. I mean, I'm, I'm starting to think that this might be more smoke and mirrors and they're not really giving me the full story. You know, I... Oh, sorry. Yeah, I thought I was muted. Um, honestly, I, I, I don't know. Honestly, I think so much of what it is is just based on recent web activity, recent searches. <laughs> really, I think so little of it is based on your past or that what you've necessarily, unless you've stated preferences for certain bands or movies or shows, I honestly don't think, um, you know, what they know about you is what you searched for recently. And you'll get that until they, there must be a window in which they realize, okay, this guy's not going to buy. And then they stop serving that particular ad to you. Steph, you look like you're jumping, wanted to jump in. Yeah, I was kind of thinking about how the, the biggest turnoff for me, really, it's not that they have this information on me. It's that it really, it, it kills the illusion of self-discovery. And I want to think that I find things on the internet, you know? And when they're just served to me and I'm so obviously being targeted, um, it just makes me feel like I'm not, uh, yeah, I'm not, um, I'm not coming across it myself. And as a consumer, there's like, you know, there's that I have an appetite for that. I remember in, you know, 2012 when McDonald's started posting their calorie counts for all their items on their menu, I used to get milkshakes back then. And then that was the last time I had a milkshake because I could, it was like glaring at you that like the calorie count. And I just like, I, ignorance is bliss and I just I don't want to see calories and I don't want to know that I'm being targeted even though I know I'm being targeted it just it just kills the fun you know going with that McDonald's example one step further maybe maybe this will be a little bit clearer for everybody you know I'm talking about those experiences where you're in the car and you're driving past McDonald's and your wife turns to you and goes man, I really could go for some McDonald's fries. And it's just like, we don't have time right now. We'll get them later. And then you go home and suddenly you're getting McDonald's fries ads. You know, it's almost like there's no search involved with that. There might be some location data that you drove past McDonald's, but how did they know that that was the moment that they were supposed to serve McDonald's fries ads to you? It, it, it seems... I mean, like there's there's always that possibility that maybe there's some other social indicator. Maybe my wife posted on her Facebook saying that she wanted fries, and then that suddenly comes back on me, and I'm getting ads for fries. But it, it, it's just so creepy how quickly they glom on to what seems to be a random conversation, and it turns into a, a targeted ad. Ian, any thoughts on that? Well, look, I, we, we all have our moments where, you know, like I'm watching something on TV and I get curious about Googling something I just saw and I'm two characters into my Google search string and it completes exactly the thought I had, which was about, you know, an obscure actor or fashion designer. Like, that's just not possible. So we all have those moments. I think it's the subtlety uh, with which the data gets used that creeps people out or not. For example, um, when's the last time somebody told you they find Netflix creepy? Now, Netflix is watching everything you interact with, measuring how long, what holds your interest, and then curating based on a careful observation of your use of the service. It's pretty damn invasive when you're talking about people sitting at home alone, you know, watching programming. But it doesn't bother people because it just feels like a great user experience. Where the relevancy is only 90% or 80% or 70%, at that point you start to drift from it feeling useful and fun and seamless, and you start to feel like you're being targeted. So the more relevant, and you know, look, the Facebook audience engine, it's not just autopilot. Uh, it's, it's skillful use of that data that at least has something to do with whether you're seeing something that's 90% relevant to you or 40% relevant to you. So what you're uh, saying, what you're basically saying is that even if they are transparent, there's still no way to understand or really comprehend how you're being targeted. Because it's just like just saying that 
we got this from your social graph, really doesn't talk about the complexity of an AI that's behind the scenes that's going, this is what he's going to do next and be 99% correct. Look, I'm the chief strategy officer of a data-driven marketing agency that works almost exclusively with with the Fortune 100. Um, I should be the puppet master and know everything you're talking about and exactly how it's done, and I don't. Mm. So there's definitely stuff going on out there. As I said, we've all had moments that seem like it's just not possible, that maybe there is more surveillance going on than any of us would like to believe. But in the end, if the result of that data capture is something that an individual finds relevant or useful, they find it more pleasurable than, than they do upsetting. Uh, I was so hopeful when I saw this story. I mean, I was so excited about the fact that they were going to be opening the kimono and letting us see why they were targeting these ads. And you could always just tell a friend when they brought out their conspiracy theories, you can just go here and find out why you were targeted. But it seems like the questions are still going to be rising from this. There's not going to be enough answers to really satisfy anybody in the end. And it's not just them, right? All the data gets cross-tabulated. So they're watching your browser history. They're watching what you search for. It's it's not just what you do within Facebook. And a lot of people don't think about it that way. Yeah. But I think one of the interesting things that you were talking about as well is how it can come across as useful or it can come across as creepy. And I think as marketers, we have to just be aware of creeping people out and how to make that that use of data look like self-discovery or you know look useful or and it, it offer a value to the you're, you're audience. preaching my sermon you're preaching my sermon there stuff yeah. this is what i say yeah. over and over again i'm like i love banner ads i love the advertising that i see online because i click intentionally on stuff i like and i get served more of it and i think that that's the that's the key here and it's just like in the creepy stuff i ignore and it goes away eventually i just get yeah. stalked by the ads that i really want to see mm-hmm. And I think that's that's just the end of it. I mean, it's just like, you know, you, as a marketer, we have to be the ones presenting those ads that people actually want to see. Well, I want to move on to our final topic of the night. Um, in my annual segment on why email is not dead and why you should keep using it, McKinsey released a study with some fairly convincing data that essentially makes email out to be not only an important part of the marketing uh, arsenal, but one of the most effective marketing tools we have. Now, you all saw the report. Uh, I'm going to go with you, Ian, first. I mean, what are your thoughts on this? Is email as good as they make out in, in this study? Email is situationally very, very powerful. Um, we get more message delivery out of email than most uh, online or offline touches, right? You think about how much of your attention I get with a banner ad or a billboard on the highway, because I, I think they're comparable in, in that respect. Um, and, and if I can give you something relevant in that email, I'm going to get some time and attention. Now you're seeing more connection with video, more connection to social, the ability to click out of that email and go deep on a topic or multiple topics. So email's really valuable unless it's just kind of spammy prospecting. And unfortunately, there's still way too much of that going on out there. But, you know, um, millennials, for example, email's actually their preferred means of staying in touch with the brand. You know, a lot of folks assume that millennials would rather do it through app-based messaging or through SMS. And the reality is millennials spend 6.4 hours a day in their email, which is more than any other generation. So um, email is extremely useful. The onus is on us as marketers, again, to give the consumers something of value, something interesting, not just another cookie cutter email where, uh, you know, the most overused word now used to be integration. Now it's personalization. You know, And there are brands that define personalization as, you know, if an email comes to me and my name is in it, it's personalized. And consumers deserve and expect a lot more than that. I was going to say something, but I think Bill's going to jump in. 
Or was I wrong about that? Well, anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, from an email standpoint, I mean, what I'm most excited about, about email uh, uh, from, this, from this study, from the report that I read, was, you know, it pointed out how much flexibility it gives you in terms of the way that you can communicate to your consumer. I mean, it is like a direct mail piece. You know, it does give you that ability to put a name on there, but it also allows you to be able to customize the content and put together a creative presentation that's both meaningful and useful to the end reader of this email. I mean, Steph, that's got to be tremendously valuable to someone like you. I mean, in terms of from a, a creative standpoint, I mean, email seems like such a passe type uh, medium to be using, but at the same time, it's so creatively flexible. Oh, for sure. I, I actually just went on a subscription purge re recently. So I've been thinking about why I'm keeping some of my subscriptions and what, yeah, what their value is to me. And it's really just like curation of information as well. So if I can have a company or brand, um, put something in my email box on an infrequent basis. That's another reason why I would unsubscribe is too many. Um, and it's a very curated group of information, even products um, related to me. Um, it feels like, again, the value is that, you know, it's saving time. And based on my interests, it might even be show, showing new information or products. Again, I'm, it's not necessarily even brands that are just using um, email as well because i've seen you know artists there's there's this dj group out of vancouver that releases their mixtapes through uh eblast and it's really fun for me to get some of these subscriptions when they're basically it's just it's free uh mixtapes free information free great reading um and that's of a tremendous value to me it's when it's disruptive and it's spam that's when it's a problem and then they get a big unsubscribe Bill, anything you want to add to this? I mean, what's your thoughts on the email tactic? I, I love email. I mean, honestly, I, I think, and I probably buy more stuff that I don't necessarily need. I buy it because I got an email. And I, I honestly, I think that's, it's such an effective way to reach me. And I don't know, you know, again, this is a, you know, focus group of one, but I, you know, to me, it, it becomes my to-do list. I'm one of those people, I'm an inbox zero person, so I have to deal with it. So I have to make a choice. Am I going to, Am I going to deal with this? Am I going to buy this? Am I going to go listen to this music that somebody sent me? Whatever it is. And so I, I want to get it done. And I think email is a great way because it, and it's also, it, until I deal with it, you know, it's not like a, you know, my Facebook feed or Twitter feed or whatever, which just sort of keeps, you know, permanent, you know, or infinitely scrolling. Email is to a degree finite. And just like Stephanie, I will, if I'm tired of your emails, I will unsubscribe. But again, it takes, it does take, you have to test my patience several times before I will unsubscribe because I'm probably interested. And I think it is a great way to get, um, to get attention. And, you know, you're sitting there right, you know, right on my desktop. And again, I have to make a decision. And I think that's, what's great about email. And also when companies understand a, just a little bit about me, and or even if, you know, they even use my name and I know that's a ridiculous ploy, but if it says Bill or if it says, you know, if it's instead of just being from the company, if it's from someone at the company, which is again, it, it for somehow it feels personal and I will respond and I will buy. And then that's again, half the stuff I buy that I don't need or junk. It, it's because I bought it on email. I think I love to like exclusive access. That one gets me a lot. So like exclusive <laughs> yeah. access to like, a, you know, a fashion yep. presentation or a sale or there's some way that you're rewarded for being a subscriber. I'll, I'll never unsubscribe if you're starting to give me that type of content. And I love how, Bill, you pointed out that you're inbox zero. I'm inbox 100,000. So, um, you know, it's, it's funny how email is handled so differently. I actually depend upon flags so that I, anything that's important to me, whether it's a solicitation or it's a personal email or it's a business email, I'll flag it if it's important. And I just leave everything in my inbox because the search function on Apple Mail is so good, I can find anything I need to with just a quick search. It's, it's not even worth filing anything in different places anymore. It's just so easy. I think of email as my brain, which is kind oh, of... A, go ahead. 
No, I, no, and I do too, but I like my brain to be completely uncluttered. Um, <laughs> I, I, like, I like my brain to have as little in it as possible. And so it's funny because I, I think that if I were to see your phone and I would see that like 15,387 red bubble, that would like... Oh, no, is, there's no bubble. I've read them all. I've opened every single one of them. <laughs> I just leave them there and I delete the ones that I don't want and I keep everything that I want in my inbox because it's just easier to find it. <laughs> yeah, see, I just, I, you know, for me, it's just like that. It's delete, file, or act. And, you know, I've used that for a long time just because it's just, it, it, makes, it makes it easy. It makes it easy. And that's why, again, I think why email really works for me is because I, I, I'm going to delete it I'm going to file it or I'm going to act. And if I file a, an email, I'm never going to go back to it unless, you know, I'm, I'm searching for a bill or something like that. So that's why, you know, I think email is really effective, but I think it depends on how you use email. Mm, good points. Well, it's time for the good, the bad, and the ugly. But before we get to that segment of the show, I do want to take this quick opportunity to thank my guests again and allow them to each do a shameless plug, starting with Ian Bear. You can find him at roxa.com. I'm not going to spell it, but I'm going to put it in the uh, show notes so you can click on it to find him. Tell me, what's going on in your world, Ian? What would you like to promote? Well, if I am going to spell it uh, since <laughs> I, get, I get a plug. So it's R-A-U-X-A, -A, which uh, in Catalan pronunciation is supposed to be Rausha. So Anytime I meet somebody uh, who's from South America or Spain, uh, there's always a little bit of a struggle on the pronunciation. I'm just going to plug my clients. Go buy a Verizon phone. Go lease an Audi. Help a brother out. <laughs> and mention, mention Ian when you're doing it. So. <laughs> exactly. B-A-E-R. Well, next up, Bill Hartnett. You can find him. Um, where can they find you? Uh, uh, AMC is where you're working right now, but where would be a good place for people to find you besides LinkedIn? Oh, you know, honestly, I, I don't know that I necessarily want to be found. Um, <laughs> but, but if I if I were going to plug anything, the, the show that I've been working on uh, for the past few months, which premieres in, I guess, a month from last night, um, no, from last Friday night, so that... 12th of August uh, is the Terror Infamy, uh, second season of our anthology series. And this one is uh, centered around uh, 1941 and the uh, Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor and then the Japanese being um, put in internment camps. And uh, in terms of the terror, yes, there is a terror involved. It's a great, I think it's going to be a great show. I think it's going to be... I hope it gets some buzz, and I hope people are talking about it, but uh, it premieres in a month. Always looking for good new shows, so that sounds great. Thank you. Um, last but not least, Stephanie Hoff. You can find her. Probably the best place to find you is LinkedIn, right? Or do you have a specific site that you're trying to drive people toward? Uh, yeah, I have a portfolio site. Um, you can check it out. It's Steph Hoff, S-T-P-H-H-O-F-F, -F, uh, dot work. Um, that's kind of some more recent work that I've done, but my experience is really in luxury and fashion brands and retailers, um, or on Instagram. It's Steph underscore Hoff, H-O-F-F. -F. Yeah, I'm not, uh, definitely not, um, not looking for, uh, any, uh, big plug, but, um, definitely just check me out and connect with me, ask me questions. I'm always happy to, to chat with people over Instagram. And totally worth doing. You want to reach out to Steph if you really want to have a great, great in-depth conversation about marketing. Uh, as for me, for more information about me or the show, visit thebeancast.com. There you can find a complete show archive. You can find out how to consult with me. And you can even find out how to advertise on this program. So check it all out at thebeancast.com. And now it's time for the good, the bad, and the ugly, a rundown of the best and worst of advertising, marketing, and public relations from the last week. And first, the good. And this is the good for me. Um, a campaign from Viral Marketing Shop, Who is the Bald Guy, armed random Ma Manhattan passerbys with a real-life model of a massive firearm from the game Warframe. Warframe. Oh, boy, i got to pronounce that correctly warning them to not pull the trigger when they gave them this gun. Regardless of whether they did do that or not, a nearby police car and mailbox are rigged to split in two via remote control when the weapon is pointed toward them, leading to shock and confusion from the unsuspecting gun tenor. So basically, if I can summarize this stuff, 
they basically gave this person, random person, a gun. They told them to pose. They took pictures of them. And when they pointed the gun at the police car, it just rips it in half. I think this is really super clever, very viral, very fun. Um, got a lot of attention for them. What's your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think it's really cool, too. And I, I understand why people were chatting about it, for sure. Someone else? Yeah, I thought it was really funny. I thought it was, I thought it was great. I loved it. Again, I mean, I think this kind of stunt's been done a bunch of times, but this is so uh, explosive, so to speak. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Good point. Well, next up for the bad of the week, uh, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission, uh, FTC, as you would know them here in the country and U.S., has approved a settlement with Facebook to pay around $5 billion, which is a record-breaking penalty for a tech company. Now, the settlement comes following an investigation by the American regulator into the company's myriad privacy issues and follows two years of constant scandals. Facebook previously warned investors, and this is the part that I found to be really bad, Ian. They previously warned investors that it expected to pay out between 3 to $5 billion, so they got the maximum, and the company's stock climbed slightly after the news. In other words, $5 billion doesn't even put a dent in their profits. It doesn't hurt them in any way, and it certainly is not a slap on the wrist in any capacity. It's more like just a spit on the wrist. <laughs> yeah, it seems like it, it's cost of doing business, and you know, without naming other names, there are plenty of industries and companies out there that have pl- paid what seem like just devastating fines, certainly some pharmaceutical companies, uh, for example, uh, for, you know, bending or breaking regulations. Look, here's the reality. Um, I I think the street reacted the way it did because the fines did not exceed what Facebook had already decided they were going to pay. It was a planned expense that they incurred, and now it's done with. Mm -hmm. Um, and, And, you know, in terms of public reaction and backlash, it seems as if people are in, yes, everyone makes the threat, you know, uh, friends and family, today is my last day on Facebook, I will miss you all, blah, 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 and then, you know, they're back three days later. So people are very, very dependent on Facebook. The business reality, again, this is something they plan for, and, and the current situation is that, you know, truth and privacy are two words that used to have absolute meaning in our society, and now they're relative terms. And as a result, things like this are accepted as cost of doing business and you move forward. Mm, Good points all. Well, moving on to the ugly for the week, uh, WPP's Ogilvy this week moved to address internal controversy about its ongoing work for U.S. Customs and Border Protection, the largest law enforcement agency of the Department of Homeland Security. So basically what's coming down the pike, Bill, is that the employees find out that, wait a minute, we're working for Customs and Border Patrol? which causes a big backlash because of the whole situation on the southern border right now. Um, Everybody wants to know what they're doing, and and John Seyford is not really being completely transparent on what the work is with them. He's uh, ensuring them that it's not about messaging. It's more about recruitment. Um, It's not about dealing with the situation at the border. It's more about trying to get more agents into the fold in an agency that's kind of beleaguered. But it just all feels pretty yucky, doesn't it? <laughs> well, the, the it, I mean, look, I, it really depends on their contract, and I'm sure their contract prohibits them from saying much of anything. And so that sounded like a very corporate note written in a very corporate way to say as little as possible, but in hopes of assuaging you know the the people within the company that are that are angry or upset. And they even acknowledge that, look, anything that we write to you, we know will be shared. And with the, the ability of people to, you know, the speed of information these days, I mean, it really depends. They, I'm sure they have a fair amount of money tied up in this. How vocal will people be? How much pushback will they get? And at a certain point, and I, I don't, I know nothing about this other, you know, other than this, this kind of thing seems to come up every once in a while, depending on where a company is doing its work. And, 
you know, if, if people get loud enough, they may decide, you know what, we're going to wash our hands of this and walk away, or they may feel they've done enough and this quiets and goes away. And, you know, when it comes down to it, I mean, it's just like Ogilvy just finds himself in a really, really tough place here. It's not so much that they did anything wrong. And it's if we can believe the, the corporate statement that came down the pike and um, it, it doesn't sound like they're doing anything untoward or I- illegal or anything that's potentially damaging to the reputation of the agency. It's just that Customs and Border Patrol is getting a bad rap right now because of a bad policy by the sitting U.S. president. So we just have to see how that all shakes out. Yeah, I well, it's through. like a, it's a guilt by association kind of thing. And again, it depends on are they able to delineate the you know what that line is and what they've done, and do they delineate it clearly enough to sort of walk away from it, or will people in, internally keep making noise? And or and or externally to the point where they have to say, you know what? All right, we're done. Well, have a suggestion for this list or just want to discuss it? Comment online. Use the hashtag GBU. That's pound GBU. Well, that does it for this week's show. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, visit our website at thebeancast.com and click on the subscribe link. If you're an Apple podcast listener, we've also provided a direct link to our listing there or just search for The Beancast in the podcast directory on the Apple Podcasts app. And whichever podcast directory you use, when you subscribe, please leave us a review. Got a comment? Have a question? We'd love to hear from you. Just send your emails to beancast at gmail.com. Opening theme was performed by Joe Seibel. Closing theme by c Thanks for listening. I'm Bob Norp. We'll be back again next week. Hope you'll join us then. Exactly.